What's up, guys? This is 21 life-changing JavaScript tricks, and I've named it that because these are high-leverage yet simple tricks that can save you a lot of time, energy, and pain in the future. Now, before we get started, I just want to mention my 100% free JavaScript cheat sheet. There's no reason not to download it. And this is just JavaScript syntax you definitely don't want to forget. So link in the description and you can also get it at don'tforgetjavascript.com. Finally, I'm also releasing a JavaScript web scraping course very, very soon. We're going to be doing four different projects that show you how to get awesome data for your web apps. And not only that, but we're going to be covering how to design a good data model, how to insert this data into either a Google Sheet or a database as well as much, much more. So stay tuned for that. But if you definitely want to get updates on that, follow me on Twitter at underscore Aaron Jack. Anyway, let's get into these 21 tips right now. So let's start off with the browser API, which you can't really separate from JavaScript unless you're writing Node.js. Now I've got a console window open because we're going to talk about the different types of storage that you have in the browser. The first one is local storage. This is an object database that your browser like Chrome, like the one I'm using uses. And when you log that out, you can see that you have basically just an object with keys and values. This is a custom one I set. This is just a random one. You can get and set local storage with the get item and set item methods. So if I'm getting out that my key value, you can see my value as it printed up here. And then I can set that to a new value and print it out like so. And you can see it changed. So no reason to overcomplicate this. It's literally just an object you can use and it will persist across all your sessions. So you can close your browser, reopen it, and it'll always be there unless you manually clear it or open a window in incognito mode. So any site can use your local storage, but it is domain specific to read and write. So one site can't read your local storage from another URL. However, it's still not very secure because of cross-site scripting. So you want to be careful using this if you're a developer. Almost the same, but not exactly. We have session storage. And I say almost the same because it is the same. It's also just an object under a different name. But instead of persisting across all your sessions, well, it'll only be for one session, as you might have been able to guess. So whether this is the tab or the window, this is more ephemeral, which makes it a little more secure, but it's still subject to the same issues as local storage. And finally, we have the cookie or cookies, which you can access at document.cookie. And you can see this is instead of an object, just a long string. And the way it's separated is key equals, then the value, and then semicolon. And you can see these strings are just concatenated together. So they're one after another in a single string. Instead of five megabytes, you only have five kilobytes in the cookie. And part of the reason for that is because the cookie gets sent back and forth to and from the server on every single request. For that reason, the cookie is often used to authenticate or identify a user and store different pieces of state in your app that the server is going to need. While we're still in the browser, let's talk logging. You know about console log, of course, but did you know about console error? Okay, you definitely knew about that too, but there's also console warn. Okay, and there's console table. This last one is really useful for objects. Okay, you definitely knew all that, but did you know you can make custom colors for your logs? And all you have to do is use the percentage C interpolation tag, write a message, then as the second argument, just pass in a color uh, colon color name. Here's another little logging trick, and this one might be the most useful. Let's say you have a variable like favorite food, and you want to log this variable out at a point in your application. Now you could just do it like this, right? But then there's no indicator what this actually is. And if you have a bunch of different console logs, you're not going to know where this one is coming from. So what a lot of people do is they pass in a second argument and they say something like here, look here. But even better than that, you can actually just make this an object with reverse destructuring that is put the curly brackets around it. And it'll log out like that variable name and then the actual variable value. There's literally no reason not to do it this way. It's less typing and it's very clear what you're logging out. So pretty much always do this. That's what I would say. Since we're talking about object destructuring, let's talk about another trick that helps you write better function definitions. Let's say I have a function called get full name and it looks a little something like this. So I pass in first name, not last name and middle name and then concatenate them together. So let's define a few variables so we can pass them into our function. Okay, most of the time when we're calling functions, they're not actually near the function definition and they might even be in a different file. In fact, they usually are. So let's just pretend we don't 
have this function definition in sight. And we want to call the get full name function. And here we still have our variables. But what order were our arguments in? So right here, we're lucky enough where uh, it actually shows us it arguments come up. But let's say we just forgot and we put first name, middle name, last name. And then we got things in the wrong order, right? So we don't always get that little tooltip. Now, an easy way to solve that is actually just to do this. Let me show you what I mean. Now, we can just wrap this in curly brackets in the arguments and change our function definition. And what this is doing is it'll destructure an object that we pass in. So instead of passing in these properties in this order, first name, middle name, last name, we can do a reverse destructuring. This will create an object with first name uh, key value first name. And then we print that out. We can actually pass these in in any order. So what this destructuring in the arguments allows you to do is pass in variables in any different order and it will always uh, map them to the correct argument. So you don't have to remember an arbitrary order like this. Speaking of objects though, and arrays, you got to be a little bit careful with them because you might know they get passed by reference, not value. That is if you pass an object in as an argument to a function, well, it's going to be the same object no matter how many levels deep you pass that. For this reason, using methods like array splice is kind of dangerous because it'll change your array in all the different places it is, even if you include it in 10 different functions. And this can create some really terrible bugs that are hard to find, trust me. So when in doubt, what you want to do is just slice your array with the slice keyword in a blank parentheses, okay? Now this will just make you a copy of your given array that you can then use freely and it won't modify the original one. Another way to do this is actually to do dot, dot, dot array. That is using the spread syntax to create a new array. And this works exactly the same way as slice blank. Now doing this for objects is actually a little more complicated. If you have a simple object like this, we can just use object.assign, pass in a blank object, and then our old object, and this will make a copy, okay? So this copies the same way as array slice, but there's one major problem, and that is it does not deep copy. To show you how to fix this, I'm gonna switch over to my real code editor, VS Code. Okay, I've got my code editor open for a more complex example. We have a nested object here that is the outer user object and the inner details object. So I can make a copy of that object with object assign. So this does give me a new object, which I can change the ID on to two. And you can see that did not change the original user object. The ID is still one. You gotta be careful though, if you change the details object on either object, it will change both. So here's me changing it on the original user object. And then when I log out the object copy, well, you'll see that new name changed on both the original and the copy. Now, given that this can cause us some pretty big issues, what we actually want is a deep copy or a deep clone. Unfortunately, there's nothing built into JavaScript, but there is in what I think is the best JavaScript library that I use in pretty much every single one of my projects. And that library is called Lodash. So you can install this with a script tag or with NPM. In our case, let's just do NPM. Then we can install Lodash. Now with that installed, we can import clone deep like so with uh, module import and then just replace object assign with clone deep. Okay, and now we can see that actually fixed our problem. Change the original name to new name and our user copy has maintained our copy name. Now this library is amazing because it gives you functions that you know are going to be bug free. So we're going to talk a little more about Lodash. Aaron, you might say, are you really wasting multiple tricks on Lodash? It's not even really JavaScript. And the answer is yes, because if you're not aware of them, you can't use them. And like I said, I use this in pretty much all my projects. It's also very hard to stop using these functions once you start. All right, let's talk about the next Lodash function, which every front end developer should be familiar with. I'll introduce it with an example. So when you're typing in a form like this on Google, Maybe, you're maybe you want to search about the new machine learning algorithm. Well, every time you type, you can see that the auto suggestions change. You can see all these results down here. Okay. Fill in as I change. Now, every single time I press a key, that's a new server request returning a list like this. Now that's great for Google. They can handle a ton of traffic, but not every site can handle an every keystroke request. Okay. So in practice, what you have to end up doing is write what's called a debounce function. That is wait to send the request until the person is done typing. 
All right, so I've written a fake function to take the user input string they type in the box and return a list of suggestions, which would populate that little drop down menu. Now, again, I don't want this to be sending every time I do a keystroke because that could totally crash my server if I get high traffic. So a really good way to do that is to wrap this function with debounce by Lodash. So the way I do that is I just pass the entire function in and then I follow that with a amount of time in milliseconds that I want to wait before actually sending that request. So let's just make it one second or 1000 milliseconds. So just to give a basic example, I can call get debounce four times in a row and it will only take the last request that I sent, right? So it's kind of preventing the server from being hit too often, but it also one takes the most recent string value only because it doesn't want to uh, miss on the newer state, right? So this is a really good use case for debounce. Now you'll also notice another function up here called throttle, which is the close relative of uh, debounce. And it actually has a very different use case, which is more along the lines of rate limiting. So let me just type an example out. Okay, let's say you have a contact form on your website that the user is gonna fill out and then it'll do something in your back end. What you usually want to happen is you only want to receive that form once. But let's say on the front end, the user is clicking the submit button, you know, several different times before it actually has a chance to submit. Now, throttle would be a great use case for this because it's kind of like debounce, but it only takes the first inside the time interval. So if I write a get throttled function, or rather post throttled, And then I called that function three times. Well, it's only going to take the first one within this one second time interval. Throttle is better for things that you definitely want delivered 100%. So it'll take the first guaranteed, but then after that, there's a cool off period. Okay, moving on, we've got two more functions from Lodash, get and set, which help us deal with objects. And they can also work on arrays, but objects is the main use case. So right here, I've got a nested object, a, a user object with a profile object inside of it with a couple of properties. Now, every JavaScript developer is intimately familiar when this happens. You try to go deep into an object, user profile, full name, right? A double um, property access here. And the thing is, like most of the time in real life, this might not always be defined. So having an empty object would be fine, right? But what if you got null here? Because maybe the API doesn't perform how you expect it to. Well, you're going to get an error and basically your entire application is going to break when this happens, which you don't want. It's called a fatal error and uh, it will basically just crash everything. So how do you actually do something like this in a safer way? Well, you could do if statements and check if uh, user.profile is an object, but you know, that looks pretty terrible. So a better possible way is to use what we have up here. So to do what's called a safe get, I can just use the get function. So let's create a variable full name and let's use the get function on our user object. And then to reach into that object, we go to the profile property, just type it in as a string and then uh, the sub property full name. So it's kind of the same syntax as we have up here, but it's just passed in as a string literal. Okay, so now we're calling that. Let's just comment this out and let's just console log full name out with our little destructure trick we used before. Okay, full name Aaron Jack, that's great. So that works normally, but what if we change this to null, okay? So we actually get undefined, but not an error. So this is actually, seems like a small thing, but it's huge, right? You don't want your application to crash. And another cool thing you can do is actually set a default value. So let's say we always want this to be a string downstream of where this code is, right? I can put a default empty string value and I can guarantee this will be a string no matter what happens with this nested object. And um, you can also go multiple layers deep with this. So if you have a huge object, you can go full name, first name, and uh, that kind of thing it happens more than you would think you have a really huge object, especially in states in uh, JavaScript frameworks. So uh, that is get, what does set do? Well, maybe you can already imagine it does a pretty similar thing where you can safely set nested properties. If I set in my user object um, profile, and then, sorry, second argument, profile.fullName. And then the third argument is just the value I want to set it to. So we can do new name, right? And then if we log that out, we can see that uh, it basically safely creates my, my deep object, right? And then if I set this to null, you know, nothing's going to go wrong. So at the end of the day, you can easily write code to do this yourself, but putting it into one line, that's actually just saving you a lot of mental overhead that you would otherwise have to write out and you can just do it by importing this simple get function.
And you might not believe it, but that's actually just scratching the surface of what Lodash has. Feel free to check out the library documentation. It's really good docs, but you know, just another one I like to use, for example, is Capitalize, right? So it's just a really easy thing that's not built into JavaScript that you can use. And, you know, it's just, it's just useful because then you don't have to write your own. You know, it's always going to be good and uh, it's always going to work. So just simple stuff like this, I love using as well. All right. So I already know someone's typing in the comments. Why would you just have an extra dependency for such simple things? You know, it's wasting bundle space. This library takes space. You're downloading it, right? But what you might not know is that's not necessarily true. So if you just import everything from Lodash like this, yes, you're going to import the whole library, which again is not that big, but you know, it's still maybe probably more than you need. There's like a hundred plus functions in there. But what you might not know is if you're using a module bundler, like let's just say Webpack for React. If you import one-off functions like, let's just say set, at the bundle time, a process called tree shaking that you don't even really have to know how it works is only going to import this single function from Lodash. The rest is just going to get rid of. So it's shaking the rest of the things off. My point for saying this is if you try to use Lodash at work, you can literally just say, you know, this is what's happening. We're not importing the whole library. Don't worry about it. Because in theory, your bundler should take care of you and only import the code you need. While we're up here in the import statements, though, not too many videos actually talk about this. So maybe let's spend a little time and you can learn a new trick or two with these import statements. Now, as we were just talking about, we're importing a single function from Lodash that is being taken care of in tree shaking. And what this set function between the curly brackets is, is known as a module. So what Lodash library is effectively doing is at some point in its code, it's importing or rather exporting the function set like this. So not export default, just export. And everything that gets exported this way gets turned into a module. You have to destructure like this. One more important thing about modules, the name does matter. So if I name it set in my Lodash file, then that's also I have to import it like this. Okay. Okay. So that's modules. Now at a different point in Lodash, they're also exporting a default function. And you can only do one of these per file. Now, this is if you want to import the whole library, which people often do by not using any destructuring. So this will import the whole library. It won't use tree shaking and you're going to have the whole library in your bundle. So let's get rid of this. Okay. Back to set. Now let's say I do want to name set something else that's exported from Lodash. Now that's pretty easy to do. You can just write as set as set Lodash, and then it's exactly the same thing. Okay. So you're just casting the name from set to whatever you want as the second argument after as. Okay. Here's another cool thing you can do. You can actually mix and match default and modules in the same statement. So if I wanted to do this, I can import the default Lodash and then just get set in its own variable. And then I could do set Lodash and I can import multiple ones. I could do get as get Lodash and I can actually make it pretty complex. And this is semantically nice. This would take me multiple lines uh, before, but you know, now I don't have to do that. So bottom line, you can mix and match this as the defaults and the modules. That's just kind of the anatomy of the import statement. All right, for the last couple, I've just got a few that didn't fit into any category. And these are actually kind of the dark arts of JavaScript, not necessarily things you're supposed to do, but I think it's really good to be aware of these. Just have them in your tool belt if you're able to use them. And in fact, I use them a lot, but you know, keep it on the DL that I told you. <laughs> anyway, the first one is where you have a situation like this. You have an if statement, just a super simple conditional check followed by some simple logic inside the if block. Now, this is the right way to do it, do it right. You have your brackets like this or even like this, but this is actually four lines of your function already. This is like a third of my entire page. So what I actually think is if your team's okay with this and big if there, no pun intended, you can actually put this on one line. And this is really useful for when you have multiple if statements, maybe different flags you're checking in your function all up at the top. And for me, it's much easier to read because it's just if logged is, is logged in, return. Okay. And then if not, do this. Just two lines, super simple. And I think this actually improves readability personally. All right. Here's another example. And this is the darkest start of all. I mean, your coworkers actually may hate you if you do this, but you know, I'm just being honest. I use this one a lot and, uh, <laughs> you know, it feels good to break the rules sometimes. So anyway, 
Here's another example. You have two flags and you are setting a variable based on the value of these flags. So if paid, then set the status to paid user. Otherwise, if they're logged in but not paid, you know, you set the status here and so on. So what you have here is eight lines just to set a simple string. And I just hate it when when stuff takes up this much space. Like, I don't know what it is, but I just want to tell you this so you're aware of it. You can do this in one line. And the way to do that is with a ternary operator, more specifically, a double ternary operator. So let's build up to it. If you only had one of these variables, you would write it like this. If they're paid, is paid, otherwise not paid. You probably know about this. Ternary is actually in every programming language, not just JavaScript. What you might not know is instead of just doing one, which would replace an if else, you can do multiple. So if paid, is paid. Else, is a lot. are they logged in? Yes, if so, is logged in. No, not logged in. So the hardest part about this is understanding what's happening. But if you go through it one field at a time, it's not that hard. So you ask, are they paid? First answer is yes. Yes, set it to this variable that goes in status. No, this is basically yes, this is no. That's how I think of it. So no, what do I do? I'm starting over with a new one. No, so I'm asking, are they logged in? Yes, they're logged in. No, just return me this. So this one takes a little bit of time to understand, but I just wanted to bring it to your attention because look how clean this is. This is like what you think of code before you coded. You're like, wow, all these symbols, something magic is happening. It's just one line. Is this the closest we're going to get to poetry in JavaScript? I don't know, but I think it's nice. Other people, you know, people are already writing angry comments right now. I can, I can feel the energy, but you know, you can do this if your team lets you or if you want to piss them off. All right, guys, that is all I've got for you today. Even if those tricks don't change your life, being aware of them will help you out in the future if you run into these sort of situations where you would need some of these tools. If you like this video, I do have another JavaScript tricks video, so check that out on my channel. And I just want to remind you, go check out my cheat sheet if you haven't already. It's totally free. No reason not to get it. And uh, it's actually, you know, just simple syntax you wouldn't want to forget. Nothing as complicated as this video. And also, if you're not already aware, I do have a JavaScript algorithms course too that I released a few months ago. People are getting really good results with it. It's fully animated and it's the best way to learn the common algorithms you need for interviews. So go ahead and check that out too. That link is also in the description. 20% off with the code SUMMER20. Wow, I feel like I'm an advertisement in this video. I hope you guys are all right with that. You know, I got to make a little bit of money to get the new Estonia Digital Nomad Visa. You need to make 3,500 a month, basically, if you're not aware. So anyway, I will catch you guys soon. I got some videos planned in the works. Stay tuned on my channel. Follow me on Twitter and I will see you guys in the next one.